What a tremendous truth this morning as we open our Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel. The song fits right into where we're going this morning in the passage of Scripture as we continue our series on fabulous, fabulous lessons from the first three kings. The title of the message this morning, The Message from the Mess. Have you ever made a mess of things in life? Have you ever just made a royal, just whole, just unbelievable, just terrible mess of things? We're going to look this morning at a time in Scripture where one of the kings made a mess of things. One of the kings made some decisions that were not pleasing the Lord, were not good, and made a mess, a royal mess, the message from the mess. Children in the house, there are some times that kids can make a mess out of things. Kids like to draw on walls. I've heard about kids painting vehicles. Those are just messes. There's not a real message in those messes. But in our life, as Christians, as people, do you know that God wants to take the mess of your life and make a message out of it? A message for others, a message for you. God wants to make a message out of the mess. In 2 Samuel chapter number 11 and 12 this morning, we're going to learn about King David. Now, we've looked at David and Goliath, but now we're going to look at David and Bathsheba. If I were to ask this morning and just say the name David and left the other part blank, David and, some of you would have said Goliath, some would have said Bathsheba. David is known for both circumstances, one in victory and one's a mess, but both bring a message to us. In this story, in this account, we'll find out that David ducked his duty. We'll look at all the fact that David dodged the hard questions. David determined his actions. David deceived others. And finally, that David desired forgiveness. We'll look at some of the factors, uh, some of the things that happened in David's life that brought him to this point, I believe, where he made a royal mess out of his life. I don't know about you, but I want, I wouldn't mind repeating the story of David and Goliath in my life. I don't want to repeat this one. But there's a message from the mess in King David. I want you to know three things today. I'll hit them now, hit them at the end of the sermon. Understand three truths. So first of all this, God is still good when we make a mess. You're, you're gonna, you may make some choices. You make some bad choices. David made some awful choices in this, in this passage, terrible choices. Adultery, deceitfulness, and murder, and cover-up. Boy, if it was a movie, you couldn't watch it. But God is still good when we make a mess. Aren't you glad God is good all the time? Because you and I are prone to messes. May not be the same as David and in comparison. Well, he made a big one, but we make messes of our life on a regular basis. God is still good when we make messes. We can trust, we can trust him like Brother Dalton sang about. We can bow the knee like the choir sing about. We can trust. God is still good when we make a mess out of things. Oh, the devil will come in. He'll want to say things like this in your mind, put thoughts in. You know what? God doesn't care. You got yourself into this mess, now get yourself out of it. God is still good when we make a mess out of things. Number two, I want you to know this morning, number two, that God is still loving when we make a mess. Listen, parents, this is something that we are guilty of sometimes. Your kids will make a mess out of something. Bad choices are just a mess. If you're not careful, you will give them a false view of God. Sometimes parents will give the silent treatment to their children. You know that God never gives us a silent treatment? You know that, don't you? God always listens. God still is loving even when we make a mess. He may let us reap some of our own actions, but he loves us so much. God is not only good, he's still loving when we make a mess. He loves us as much before the mess as during the mess and after the mess. His love doesn't change. Why? Because the Bible says that God is love. His character, his being is one of love. Does not change with our actions. When you make a mess... God still loves you. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God still loves me when I, when I make a mess. Because like you, like all of us, sometimes we make a mess out of things. God is still good when we make a mess. God is still loving. And God wants to take our messes 
He wants to make a message. This morning, I want to look, direct our attention to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. So we look through this particular passage of Scripture, a sad portion of Scripture. A sad portion. I wish this had never happened. And I imagine by the end that David had the same wish that I had. There's no doubt in my mind that at the end of this particular account in chapter 12, if David could go back and change it, he would have. You ever felt that way in life? If I could go back and change it, I would have. But just because David made some mistakes, just because he made a mess, does not mean that God stopped loving him, that he's not good, that he couldn't make a message. Look with me in the first few verses of 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David knew Uriah well. Uriah was one of the mighty men of David. Uriah was not unknown in the kingdom, unknown in Jerusalem, or unknown in David's army. Uriah, he was not the top of the list of the mighty men, but he was on the list of mighty men. He was a man among men. He was a fighter among warriors. This man, he was known. The servants were clear to say, David, Bathsheba, she's married. David sent, I'm sorry, and David sent messengers, verse 4, and took her, and she came unto him, and he lay with her, and she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house. The woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to the house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants for his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, and David said to Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down to the the house? Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink, and to lie with my wife as thou livest, as thy soul livest? I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie in his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. It came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. The men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people, the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if it so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Know ye not that they would shoot down from the wall, or shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerobasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that, that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say, Thou thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. The messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even upon the entering of the gate. And the shooter shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Job, Let not this thing displease, displease thee. For the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him." 
When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The message from the mess. Lord, I thank you for this time this morning. Lord, I pray that you turn our hearts towards you. Lord, I pray that as we work through this particular passage in this story, Lord, that you would give us some truths that would be helpful to us. Lord, give us some thoughts from your word that would help us live for you in a better sense, Lord. And I pray that if there's those who have made a mess out of things, Lord, that you would show them today that you can make a message out of their mess. Lord, help us this morning. Help me as I speak. May our hearts be turned towards you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. The story of David and Bathsheba found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Some have heard the story before. For some it may be a new story. David there, a time when kings were supposed to go to battle, David stayed home. When David should have been out with his men and the warriors and the fighters, David just stayed home. From there, a series of events happened, a series of choices. Because of those choices, there were consequences. This morning, I want to notice some messages from the mess that will hopefully help us so that we don't make a mess out of things. And then if we do make a mess, how to come back to God. Or if I can, when we make a mess, come back to God. I want to notice this morning, the first incident that happened was that there was a message of complacency. Verse number one, the Bible tells us that David stayed home. History tells us that at this point, David was around 57 years old. Now, to put that in kind of comparison for you, David most likely fought Goliath right around 15 to 17 years old. So 15 to 17 years old, David had just the victory of all victories. But after that, all right, weekly, monthly, yearly, David was seeing victory after victory after victory. Remember the ladies, the women in Jerusalem would sing about Saul and David. And they would say that Saul, he slew his, he killed his thousands, but David, his ten thousands. Boy, David was just blessed by God during this time. He was 17 and then 18 and then 20. And boy, in there, Saul became angry at David and David had to flee. And David uh, uh, fled from Saul and was running on the countryside and still God was blessing him and people came to him and eventually uh, he became king at age 38. Right around 38, I believe it was 38 exactly, 38 years old. So he's been king now for right around 20 years. He's seen huge victories, he's ruled and, and he's been writing these things we call Psalms. You know that they say that David is probably the best known author. They may not know who David is, but think of Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is everywhere, is it not? And people who have never been in a church, opened a Bible, can quote parts, if not all, of Psalm 23. It's on the wall. It's, in, it's on the internet. It'll be posted here all over the place. In times of trouble, people will quote parts of Psalm 23. David wrote Psalm 23. He'd been writing beautiful psalms or songs that he would sing with his heart. You see, David, I believe, became complacent. He relied, began to rely on past accomplishments. For whatever reason, this particular year, David didn't go and fight. For whatever reason, this particular battle, David stayed home. Maybe he wasn't feeling well this morning. Maybe when he woke up, he had a little bit of a headache. Maybe he was just a little bit tired this time. And boy, you know what? I've fought a lot of battles. I've been in a lot of wars. I've defeated a lot of enemies. God used me. But this time, I just don't want to go fight. I just become a little bit complacent. At this point, I don't believe that David was necessarily in a sinful place. But he wasn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. I don't think that David woke up and said, you know what? I don't want to worship God. I don't want to serve God. I want to live my own life. He just became complacent. He had been close to God. He had seen victory. But he'd also been at this for a while. 
He had been blessed, but you know what? Now it's time for someone else to be blessed. Now it's time for someone else to see some victory, so I'll let them have the chance. I'll let them have the opportunities to serve. Boy, I've served a long time here. Well, I've had a lot of years in Sunday school and a lot of years on the bus route. I've sung a long time in the choir. It's time that someone else had the blessings that I had in life. Complacency. Oh, we wrap it up nice, don't we? Nice package is a gift for someone else. Now it's your turn. But ultimately, there was some complacency going on here. Complacency makes us become inactive. There was a tremendously famous tightrope walker by the name of Philippe Petit. When the Twin Towers were still standing, apparently he walked a tightrope between the two of them. 1,300 I mean, plus feet up in the air. You wouldn't get me to do that 10 feet up in the air. All right, and then a little while after that, he was just a mere 82 feet up in the air. And people were lauding that accomplishment as more than the Twin Towers. Probably because when he did 82 feet, he was between two buildings, and he was blindfolded, and it was raining. During the time it was 82 feet up in the air, he did a backward somersault on the tightrope line. Nuts. Nuts. Shortly after that, Philip fell from 30 feet. Suffered massive internal injuries, apparently. It is purportedly that he said when he fell, I can't believe it, I never fall. How do you fall from 30 feet, but not from 1,300 feet? Complacency. Complacency. You see, Christian, David began to get complacent. And because he got complacent, the groundwork was set for some bad choices to be made. Back here, it's just, oh, I'm tired today. You know what? I, I think I'll just live stream today. I'm a little bit tired today. Careful. Careful. Don't get complacent. They say this, that since 1991, Americans have become more spiritually complacent. This was done before the pandemic, but they said that 40% of Christians who claim to be born again do not attend church or read the Bible in a typical week. Another 30% are not absolutely committed to the Christian faith, and 70% aren't even involved in church. Complacency. Oh, David was still king. David was still in charge, but he was complacent. Listen, my friend, get the, mess, the message from the mess. If you don't learn anything else, don't become complacent. Don't become inactive. Don't become just content with what God had done, what he used to do. Listen, focus on what God wants you to do today. Not only did David grow complacent, David began to compromise. Look in verse number 2. It came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the, women, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. They say that in that culture, the king's house would have been the highest point around. All the city, nothing would have been higher than the king's house, than the palace. So here David is, evening time, and begins just to walk. Don't know why he took a walk. Maybe he couldn't sleep. Should have been out fighting the battle. Shouldn't have been at home, but he was at home now and began to walk around. And all of a sudden, something caught his eye. A lady. It wasn't his. The Bible says that she was very beautiful to look upon. How did David know that? Because he looked back. Right? Little compromises. Little compromises lead to big problems. He stayed home. He got bored. He stared at what he shouldn't look at. He was attracted to what wasn't his. 
Little compromises lead to big problems. From here, we have a downward spiral of events. From here, David begins to ask, and he says, who is that? Who is that pretty one over there? And the servants then say, David, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Seems like they're trying to tell David, David, listen, she's off limits. David just ignores it. David ignores little compromises. David doesn't listen to the advice or the counsel or the answers from the servants. From there, he has her come and they have an affair, have an adultery. Before long, Bathsheba sends back and says, uh oh, I'm pregnant. And David says, well, little compromises have now led to big problems, right? He says, oh no, I know how to fix it. I'll get Uriah back in town. I'll have a masterful cover-up plan. He calls Uriah back. I read it earlier. He calls Uriah back. He says, Uriah, you're back. Great. Glad to see you. You know, you're the one I wanted to come back because you're, you're the special one to me, Uriah. Made up some half lame excuse to get Uriah back. But Uriah wouldn't go down his house now, would he? Notice the Bible tells us that the servants tell David that Uriah stayed at the palace all night. Seems like they kind of knew what David was trying to do at this point. And they said, David, you might want to know this, but Uriah stayed here all night. What? David says, well, I'll fix this. I still have some scheming and, and uh, plans I can do. And that night, he gets Uriah drunk. Little compromises lead to big problems. Tries to send Uriah to his house again, and someone said this, that Uriah drunk had more character than David sober. Uriah right, still wouldn't go down there. Now David's plan is thwarted. Now David can't have the cover-up. So what can he do? He has to get him out of the picture. Think about this. David started just by staying home when he should have been in battle. Then he got up when he probably should have been in bed. Then he started looking when he should have turned away. Then he started asking when he should have listened. And now he's planning murder. Here, Uriah, take this. And he knew that Uriah had enough character not to look at the letter that he was going to send to Joab. Joab, send Uriah to the hottest part of the battle. All Joab had to know something was going on by now. Send him to the hottest part of the battle and withdraw. Get rid of him, Joab. So Joab does that. He knows because when Joab sends a messenger back, he tells the messenger, listen, if David's not happy, just give this little key phrase, Uriah is dead. And he won't be angry with you any longer. And that's what happens. Uriah gets, gets killed. You see, little compromises lead to big problems. And there's something we need to learn this morning from this message, from the mess that David made, that a little compromise in your life may seem small today. When David stayed home, he had no plans to make a mess out of things, but he made a mess out of things because of a little compromise. You see, someone said it this way, no, not committing at all means not committing at all. Winter was coming, and a hunter went out to find a bear. He was cold. Story goes, a fable goes, he stumbled across the bear, and the bear also had a need. The bear was hungry, and the hunter was looking for a warm winter coat. So they compromised, and the bear got his fill, and the hunter got a warm winter coat. <laughs> Little compromises lead to big problems. If you have a thousand acre farm and someone offered to buy it, you could agree to sell the land except for one acre in the center. But by keeping that one acre in the center of your farm, a thousand acre farm, you would have guaranteed access until you sold it because of right of passage. Or this way, there's a man who wanted to sell a house. I heard this story years ago. I want to sell a house, but the Folks who wanted to buy it couldn't afford the full price. So the man who was selling the house said, listen, I'll sell the house to you for a reduced rate. I only ask for one thing, the nail above the door. 
That one right there? He goes, just, I'm going to own that part. Just that nail. I don't want the foundation. I don't want the doors. I don't want the windows. I don't want the floors inside. I, I just want that nail. Well, he was giving such a great deal in the house. Now this family who couldn't afford the asking price said, well, what, what is the big deal? Of course I can afford this house. And they bought the house with the agreement that the former owner would retain ownership of the single nail above the front door. Well, for a while, everything was just fine. New family moved in, and the house was up to their expectations. They remodeled the inside because it was their house. They painted the front door and painted the outside, but they painted around the nail because that's the only thing they didn't own was that little nail in the front of the house over the front door. A little time passed, and the former owner, man who had sold the house but retained the nail, really felt that he wanted to buy the house back. He came to the family who was currently living there and said, listen, I know I sold you this house, sold you for a great deal, but it was part of the family history, and I'd like to buy it back. And, of course, the family said, no, we love our house we bought from you. We're not going to sell it back to you. Well, the man said, well, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you more than you paid for it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you what I originally asked for. I'll give you more. Still, the, the family who lived there said, no, no, you, you can't have this house back. And, and said, okay. Now, the next morning... Family came outside and there was a dead carcass of an animal hanging on the nail by the front door. It was gross, disgusting. Ugh. But they couldn't touch it because it wasn't theirs and they didn't own the nail. They called the man and they said, listen, sir, you got to remove this dead, this, this dead animal. It's, it's, oh, it, it looks terrible. He said, nope, that's my nail. I'm going to hang that on there. Next day they woke up. Animal was still there. Except now it had been warm out. It began to rot a little bit and stink a little bit. They called the owner back, said, uh, the former owner, listen, sir, you've got to remove this dead animal. This is, this is terrible. It's starting to sink out there. He said, listen, that's my nail. I can do whatever I want to with it. And that thing is staying. Continued on. A week passed. By now, the flesh was just rotting. The flies and the maggots smelled horrible. And they called the former owner back. Please, please, sir, we beg you. We beg you. Please. No, that is my nail. I will do whatever I want to with it. It stays. It wasn't long. And the family couldn't stay in the house any longer. Stunk so badly. Their friends wouldn't come and visit. They were known around town as the house with the dead animal in front. The stinky house. Kids ridiculed at school. Stinky house kids. That they had to leave town. The former owner got his house back. All because he retained ownership of one nail. Little compromises lead to big problems. My friend, in your life and my life, we will want to excuse the little compromises. We will want to say that's not a big deal. That's just one little area. That's just one little nail that the devil has. That's just one little road that the devil has. Everything else, the floors and the closets and the walls and the front door and the siding, that's all the Lord's and that's pleasing him. There's just one little spot that doesn't please him. My friend, one of the messages from the mess this morning is little compromises lead to big problems. You never know where the end result will be. You just can make sure everything is Jesus Christ's. David allowed one little area. Years ago, here at this church, there was a man. He listened to Pastor Roulette speak on the danger of the wrong kind of music in his life. The man that night went home and threw away every wrong album, CD, music that he had, except for one. Except for one. It's a little while later that he was 
back in a life of sin. Came across, across paths and the question was asked, well, what's going on? How are you doing? I'm doing terrible. And he told that story. He said, I just left just one. Small compromises lead to big problems. David's life, it seemed like a small compromise. I stay home. Seemed like a small compromise. I'm bored. Seemed like a small compromise to just keep looking. Right? No one's hurt. Lead to big problems. My friend, this morning, in your life, in my life, let's not become complacent. And let's not have the compromises that will ultimately make a mess out of things. God has a message for you and I this morning to please him. And please him completely. I wonder if in your life you've been saved. You've trusted Jesus Christ. I wonder if in your life you've surrendered almost all to Jesus Christ. But I wonder if in your life there's one nail left. One spot. I imagine if you could ask David a year later, David, how's that working out for you? I imagine he'd say this, I wish I had never looked back. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your truth. Lord, I pray this morning you'd help us to be honest before you. Lord, you know that the devil wants and seeks to get a foothold in my life and each life of these Christians, Lord. But Lord, we can learn from David that a small compromise, a little compromise, will lead to a big problem. I wonder if you're here this morning, whether your head's bowed and eyes closed, say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. God was touching my heart, and there's an area that I need to make sure that I surrender to him. I don't want to make a mess out of things. Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? God touched me this morning. Who's that? Who's that? That's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me? Slip your hand up, slip back down. We'll see you. God bless you. Who else? Hands all over. So that's me, Pastor. I don't want to make a mess of David. Past victory. Called the sweet psalmist of Israel. Who else? I didn't raise my hand before. I'll raise it now. Pray for me, Pastor. We pray for the others. One of you here this morning, you say, Pastor, I don't know that if I die, I'd go to heaven. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Would you pray that I know how to go to heaven? If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up, slip it back down? I'll call no more attention to you than did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you this morning, my friend. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know our hearts, our lives. Lord, you know how the devil wants to sift us, the Bible says, as weed and find a place in. Lord, may we be genuine before you. Lord, may we not allow any area to be under the control of Satan and not be surrendered to you. Lord, many have indicated by an upraised hand that you touched their heart this morning. Lord, help them to respond to you. Lord, bless this invitation. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.